thank you for choosing to watch our video. Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon for notifications of new content. Leave us a comment and watch the other videos that we're happy to provide for you. And now, on to the sermon. Today, the church at Groveton is closing. That has been a church that has been around for decades. A lot of men who you may not be personally familiar with, but have been unbelievably instrumental in advancing the kingdom of God, have started there, have worked there. A lot of our men, I mean, if I, if I numbered them, it would easily go into double digits. A lot of our men over the last 20 and 30 years from the loop have gone out and worked with that congregation. Lance and Mike Grayson just being three of the latest ones. So today they've had to make the, the difficult decision to, to close. Uh, Tim Beeman is the one who's going to preach this last time. He asked Randy and Nita Joe to come out and lead singing. Tim did something very nice. He asked all of the men who, at, at least that he could easily contact, Mike was one of them, Grayson was one of them, to, to write kind of a little statement about what going out to Groveton has meant to them. How encouraging it's, it's been to them how encouraging it is to all of us, how encouraging it is to our children as we try to go out and we advance the kingdom of God. So th these are a lot of brethren who are going through some heartache this morning and, and they'll continue on. They'll go to Centralia where Lance is now. They'll go to uh, Crockett. They'll go to Corrigan. They, their, their life as God's children, as faithful God's children, will, will continue but the place where they worship will, will be no more. And so we need to think about that and we need to keep them in mind because this is just, we, we get, we, it, it's easy for us to get down about it. It really is. But I, I must, I can't emphasize enough that everything has a life cycle to it. Everything in life has a life cycle to it, including churches that are made up of, living human beings who are doing their very best to serve God. And those churches begin, and then those churches have to close. And, and today is just one of those unfortunate times where we come to the closing of this chapter of these brethren who have, who have meant a lot to us in this room. And they've, and they've meant a lot to the kingdom of God. So, please think about them. Please pray for them. They'll, they'll continue. And, and pray for all of the ones who've gotten so much encouragement from going out there and, and doing the best that they can to edify those brethren, honing their talents to further expand the borders of the kingdom. It's, it's, meant, a, it's meant a lot to them. Um, <laughs> when Grayson first started preaching, his sister had to, had to, <laughs> had to carry him because uh, he couldn't drive. And where was the first place that he had to go? It, it was out to Groveton. So it, it means a lot to me. And and it, it means a lot of people, to a lot of people in the room. But we're going to look forward this morning. We're actually going to look into the future because that's a great place for us to look. And it's a great thing for us to think about. So let's go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, we're going to think about the conversion of the multitudes. But before we get there, I want you to think about a, what a lot of people think of conversion today. If you watch the Super Bowl, there were several advertisements on the Super Bowl from a, a group of very, very wealthy Bible believers, and they surrounded the theme of, He Gets Us. So this advertising campaign went into last year's Super Bowl. They were broadcast throughout the year in 2023. Now that as 2024 has rolled around, we reached this year's Super Bowl. 
they were in it again. To, to my understanding, the sum total that's been spent has been around a billion dollars. So this has not been a small amount of money. The particular one that ran during this year's Super Bowl with He Gets Us portrayed the washing of Jesus' disciples' feet in John chapter 13. And then as you can see from the screenshot in front of you, it took the concept of, of one person washing another's feet outside of a family planning center, outside of a, a place where someone would get abortions. And the idea of people being servants and even the idea of Jesus getting us is a biblical concept. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3, which we've read countless times in front before the table in front of us partaking the Lord's Supper. The Lord was acquainted with our griefs. He knows our sorrows. The, the idea of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, he, he sympathizes with our weaknesses. I mean, Jesus Christ gets us. He, he definitely does. But if I'm being as charitable as I possibly can, this kind of effort, and, and I know, I'll go ahead and admit that boiling down the essence of the gospel in a 30 second commercial is incredibly difficult. But it's a little bit too much of a soft sell. Here's what I mean by that. The idea that Jesus gets us is correct. But if you stop there, you miss the essence of the gospel. Jesus wants us to come as we are. But it doesn't end there. Jesus wants us to come as we are. He wants us to hear the life-giving gospel. He wants us to respond to that gospel through repentance, through changing our lives, coming as we are, but not leaving the same way. He wants us to be faithful, good servants of His for the rest of our lives. I know that's difficult to boil into 30 seconds. But really, that is what the gospel wants. And when you even go to the website, hegetsus.com, there's a lot of very soft sell ideas. One of the first things, and I couldn't let the animation run, I couldn't capture the animation so that you could see it, but right when you log in, I mean, what, what kind of plays in front of you are ideals to kind of distance themselves from what people think about church. We're not going to be judgmental. Jesus gets us. In fact, we're not even going to push that you come to a church. And it raises the question, Jesus absolutely gets us. But guys, do we really get Him? Do we really get Him? I can convince you in minutes that Jesus Christ gets us. But do we really get Him? And one of the ways that we're going to show that, in fact, actually the only way we're going to show that this morning is by looking in the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, you've got the conversion of the multitudes. And there are three things that are taking place in this conversion of the multitudes that helped people, that allowed people to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And so as we kind of meander through the context of Acts chapters 3, 4, and 5, but particularly chapter 5, Let's notice, what were three things that actually helped the church grow? I, I talked about the fact, I mentioned the fact that we're going to talk about the future, and this is it, we need to consider that future. So, let's go to the book of Acts. First up, in the book of Acts, let's consider, in Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 5, let's begin now in verse 12. Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, this will kind of set the stage for us, Acts 5 starting in 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. They were all with one accord in Solomon's porch right there in Jerusalem. Yet none of the rest of them dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So how did they do that? The first point that I want to make to you is that they did it with powerful preaching. 
And you would think that powerful preaching had to mean they had to have powerful men. So Acts chapter 4, let's look in verse 13. Acts chapter 4, back up to verse 13. And as you're kind of turning there, the context of 3, 4, and 5, because they do form kind of a unit, is that in Acts chapter 2, the church is started. In Acts chapter 3, they are starting to preach around in Jerusalem. And as they start to preach, there is a lame man. And Peter and John healing. And so it causes this incredible controversy that the Jewish leaders just can't ignore anymore. So 3, 4, and 5 then see them kind of embroiled in this controversy of healing this man that pretty much no one can deny, but then asking, what can we do about it? So Acts chapter 4, verse 13, in describing the people who were doing it, and this is primarily Peter and John, but it includes all of them. It said, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. So two words that are used. The New King James Version uses uneducated. That means that they didn't go through a rabbinical school. Rabbi Hillel, Rabbi Shammai were two very, very prominent rabbis who had taught kind of, kind of like you would say the University of, of, of Hillel, the University of Shammai. They weren't studying in those. So therefore they were, as the New King James Version says, they were uneducated. The word, the word untrained means that they essentially weren't set up to be in front of public. Actually, the word basically means a private person. These people weren't geared to be orators, to be in front of other ones, but they had been in they had been in front of, they had been with Jesus. By the way, John chapter 7, verse 50, Jesus was called untrained. So it wasn't something that was just given to the apostles. It was Jesus as well. But yet, the time that these men spent in close proximity to the power of Jesus Christ made them most definitely fit for their work. Someone estimated that as you were thinking about the fact of them being in the school of Jesus. Them being in the school of Jesus. That in the three years that they spent in proximity to the Lord, knowing His character, learning His character, taking in His character. Because we can read black and white words on a page and we can know Jesus. But you understand that when you're around someone all of the time, you get that true depth of really truly knowing watching what he was able to do, watching the miracles that he performed. Someone speculated that if you were to just total up those number of hours, it would have went to degree upon degree upon degree that you could learn in a university. So yes, they were uneducated. They were, private, they were untrained. But it did not mean that they did not have the, the right, that they didn't have the, the knowledge and the learning to do what they did. When you go in chapter 4, we were reading in verse 13, so now glance down into verse 19 and look what's taking place. In verse 18, let's actually say this, so they called them and they commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. This was part of the way that they were going to fix the problem. The Jewish leaders will just tell them to stop it. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and which we have heard. What did that take? It took power. And Albert Barnes, who's been a, a well-known commentator that lots and lots of people have turned to for exposition. And we're talking about someone who'd written 150 years ago. He made this statement that their power wasn't due to the art of rhetoric. It wasn't due to them being well trained to be in front of people because obviously they hadn't been. He said their power comes from the deep conviction of the truth of what they spoke. And that that conviction could have been attained only by their having been with Jesus 
and their having been satisfied that He was the Christ. And brethren, when we think about the fact of someone being convicted that Jesus was indeed the Son of the living God, that He was the Christ, that's going to be of far more value than any kind of letters that someone can put behind their name. It just absolutely is. And so when, when we have people who stand in front of us, and whether they're going to preach, or whether they're going to teach, or whether they're going to spend time with us personally, sit down with us in, in, in our homes, in coffee shops, and talk to us about the Gospel, those things have very little meaning. What does have meaning is how convicted they are that Jesus is the Son of God. How willing they are to put their lives on the line to try to teach such a noble truth. The, the New Testament church could grow. And as we are today, experiencing the life cycle of churches, how they begin, how they continue, how they die, we know that. They can always continue not by getting away from powerful preaching, not by soft-selling the Gospel, but by having people of conviction and truth, those who are willing to stand up and say what needs to be said. Now, let's secondly kind of look at this from another idea. Another idea. Let's go to Acts chapter 4 again. Now it's looking a little further in the, a little further in the chapter. Acts chapter 4, let's look in verse 31. I had said that these men were, were ignorant and untrained, uneducated and untrained. Think about what they were. I mean, they were, they were fishermen, they were herdsmen, they were carpenters, they were farmers, they were tax collectors. But what did they have? They had the capability, not just to show people truth, but they had the ability to live it out in their lives. And boy, did that make an enormous difference. Acts chapter 4, now let's, going to, now let's look in verse 31. Acts 4 verse 31, When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. Okay, Again, untrained, uneducated men. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So I, I want to, just for the next few minutes, suggest to you that what's about to take place, that is that they were going to sell their possessions and then they were going to distribute it charitably among all of the people who were suffering, was something unheard of. Unheard of. These were all Jews. We know this. Acts chapter 2 had, had shown this. And when you look back in the Old Testament, one of the things that you pr prominently see, specifically in the book of Leviticus, is that God had made sure that His people were going to be taken care of. Now let me, I'm just going to take a second and go through this. In Leviticus chapter 25, there were instructions for indentured servitude. If you were in debt and you were heavily in debt, you could go to work for someone and work that debt off. But that debt ended at seven years. It couldn't be. Someone couldn't rope you in for a lifetime. God made sure of that. In Leviticus chapter 25, just a little bit further, there were laws that talked about the transfer of property in order to relieve poverty. So if someone were sitting on an asset, but they had reached difficult times. God had set laws in place to protect the fact that someone couldn't just be taken advantage of. Okay, I need money. I've got a piece of land. That land's worth, in, in our kind of day and time, that land's worth $50,000. Well, you need the money today, so I'll tell you what, I'll give you $5,000 for it. That's not that great of a deal. But you're desperate. You're going to take it. No. God fixed that. God fixed that. They couldn't just take advantage of each other. Even the poor of the land, God left the, the corners for them to come in and, and glean and to take what they needed to for their survival. I, 
you know, brethren, it's right and good for our God. Now, we can debate on how much is right and good, but it is right and good for our government to take care of and to provide for those who are indigent. That's what God was doing. But what takes place here was absolutely unheard of. Now, yes, for sure, God had told them that they were going to make absolutely sure that they needed to take care of what they're tithing. Malachi chapter 3, again, it's read in front of the table a lot of times. Malachi chapter 3 says that they were supposed to tithe, but they failed to do so. What you're looking at now, though, was just so incredible. Let's look beginning in verse 33. Let's keep on going down through this context. Verse 33 of Acts chapter 4. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. Now, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. They laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated the son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, he sold it and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. I mean, again, just unheard of. Now, I need to stop here. And, and I need to carefully say that I've got to make a small diversion. And with this diversion, I'm going to spend the rest of the time at the, in the point. I am not going to be advocating from here on to the end of the point that we need to be giving people money in order to spread the gospel. I am not going to advocate that, that we need to be taking care of and giving people food in order to make sure that they can hear the gospel and believe and obey the gospel. If you follow it all through the context, if you look at other places in the New Testament, those Christians were not giving out benevolence, hoping and praying that people would listen. That's not what was happening. These Christians were becoming children of God, they were having difficulties, and the other Christians then we're helping out. So here's the point that I actually want to make. The gospel is always going to be spread, not with just powerful preaching, but with the lives of the people who are trying to actually live it and communicate it. So here with these Christians, in this specific instance, they could sell what they had and help other Christians. But what can Christians do to try to help and try to assist non-Christians? They most definitely can help out of their own funds, but they also can just simply live a righteous life. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Because Matthew chapter 5 to me is just the definition of this. Matthew chapter 5, when you look starting in 13, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and they put it under a basket, but on a lampstand that it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Ephesians chapter 2. You know, it makes the case that we are saved by grace through faith and that's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not of works that we should boast. But we are created in God as His workmanship. We go, we pursue good works. And Paul, especially in his writings, I mean in a bunch of places in his writings, talks about good works. Look up good works. See how many times it's mentioned in the New Testament. We need to be living this, guys. We need to be living this. And whether I'm living it as a member of this congregation, and this congregation is helping the poor among the congregation, or the poor saints who are elsewhere in the world, I need to be doing that. Or whether I need to be living as a Christian and helping those people who are out there who need assistance, I need to be doing that. I need to be living it. Because as I live it, it communicates the fact that it means something to me. I can tell you all day that the gospel means something to me. What the actions do 
is that it proves it. We all need to be proving it. Because these people demonstrated, I mean in a big, big way, and again, I'm not even advocating communal living where we sell everything that we have and we pool all of those. Ads. I'm, not even, I'm not doing that. But it demonstrates that when the gospel took over these people's thinking, they were willing to do things that no one else would have done. They were willing to make sure that good was accomplished. Now, our lives in a, in a steady state of continued faithfulness needs to be the same. We need to be people of good works. And we need to demonstrate our good works both by what we can do in this congregation and demonstrate our good works outside of this congregation. That's the way the gospel grows. And we can never, ever, and we should never, ever forget it. Let's go back to Acts chapter 4 though. Let's go back to Acts chapter 4 because Satan knew just how effective this was going to be. And the devil, you can imagine, is seeing something that was so good in Acts chapter 2 and then it having a little bit of problems in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4 thinking outside persecution uh, surely will dampen their resolve. And it didn't. So then came another problem. A whole different kind of problem. A problem that was from within. And that is always the way that the devil's going to work. If, if the devil can't get you from without, he will try to get you from within. And I hope that all of us can are well aware of that. I hope all of us can stand. Because this is the definite point that's made in Acts chapter 5. Satan couldn't get them from without. He's going to get them from within. So, Acts chapter 5 beginning in verse 1. Acts chapter 5 beginning in verse 1. We're going to see that the church had to grow in a way that it doesn't seem like it's natural or it doesn't seem like it's normal. But it actually grew by the fact of corrected discipline. So let's start in chapter 5 reading in verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Everyone was doing it. Everyone was doing it. And so here they are. They're doing it too. And he kept back a part of the proceeds. And his wife's wife also being aware of it. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. At this moment, at this moment, there had been no wrong done. There's nothing that said that what was, had taken place in the first two verses was wrong. So let's keep going. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself while it remained? While it remained. From the time that you sold it until the time that you came and brought the money. While it remained, was it not your own? You could do whatever you wanted with it. You could give 100%, you could give 80%, you could give 20%, you could give whatever you wanted. You didn't even have to give any of it. You could give whatever you wanted. But the problem was you brought it and said, this is everything. You've lied about it. So, in verse 4, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. The problem wasn't in what they gave. It's what they presented in that giving. And it was lying. And this was the first challenge that the church had ever faced. And, and brethren, I'm convinced that God had to show them just how serious it was. So we look in verse 5. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all of those who heard these things. The young men arose and they wrapped him up. They carried him out and they buried him. And now when it was about three hours later, when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. So she gets the capability to tell the truth. But she doesn't. In verse 8, she agrees with her husband. Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet, 
breathed her last. The young man came in, found her dead, carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all of the church and upon all of those who had heard these things. So this, the, the, the idea, perhaps it was pride, maybe the, the best way that I could describe it, is the pride of life coming in, wanting to appear that you've made a bigger sacrifice than you really made. Maybe that was it. Maybe part of it was greed. Definitely a part of it was dishonesty. But all of that worked together to contribute to Ananias and Sapphira making that unfortunate decision. When so much good had been taken place, I mean, we've looked through and we've read about all these examples of the righteous and then you've got the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. Then we just read in verses 1 and 2 and then in verse 8 what took place, the divine punishment for it. And then, the fact in verse 11, the outcome of it, it was serious. And, and the bad part was, you know, if you back up into Acts chapter 4, verse 33, we read through it, but I didn't stop and make a point of it because I knew that we would now. In Acts chapter 4, verse 33, just look back at this. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And this is the point. And great grace was upon them all. Great grace was upon them all. Let's go back to the introduction. We need to know about the love of God. We need to know about the fact that Jesus gets us. We, we need to know about the fact that He does sympathize with us. We need to know that He loves us. There is, however, another part of this. Romans chapter 2, we talked about this in our Bible class last week. Romans chapter 2, let's look in verses 4 and 5. Romans chapter 2, looking in verse 4 and 5. Here's what Paul was saying to the Jews, by the way, to the Jews. He said, do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, which is what we said in the introduction. But in accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of revelation and of the righteous judgment of God. So what do we need to know about? We need to know about the fact that He's a God of severity. And as, as uncomfortable as it seems, as difficult as it is for us to, for someone to stand up here and have to say it, or a visitor that you've invited to sit there and have to listen to it. It's part of the Gospel. It's part of the Gospel. You've got to know that God loves you. You must know that God loves you. But you must also know that there is severity. That God wants you to repent. You must know that God wants you to make the right decisions in life. They, they're learning what, what Christ requires. Let me just give you three of these really quickly. Christ wants us. He wants us to serve Him from the heart. And He wants us to freely do it. Christ wants us to deal with our sins. And He wants us to deal with them very honestly. Come as you are. I, I don't have a problem with that. But I want to make sure that as you come as you are, you're going to have to make the decision with what you do in your life. I can't make you do something with your life. But I am charged by the Almighty God along with these brethren to make sure that something is communicated as to what has to be done. That's why we've got Acts chapter 8, 20-22. Here was a... Here was an individual, he'd just become a Christian. And he'd done something wrong. Sort of just like Ananias and Sapphira. And what was told for him to do? Repent and pray for forgiveness. Don't leave it the way you are. Change it. Change it. Christ expects us. Christ expects us to love each other fervently. And part of that love, guys, means righteousness. It means justice. It means judgment and understanding all that it is entails that's what happens in Acts chapter 5 it, it, it really really does 
they learned that the church has to be kept free of impenitent sinners. Because again, one of the go back to point number two, one of the one of the best ways that a church is able to make an influence in the world is by its righteous life. When there are people who do not live up to that righteous life and they don't want to change, then they've got to be removed from that congregation. What happened in Acts chapter 5 was God's concern. It was a sin against God. He could deal with it the way that He chose. He chose to take their lives. Now the church now has the right to remove people from its fellowship. To disfellowship them. To, to, to express a process of withdrawal or a process of discipline. And again, just like Jesus gets us and just like I can read about the fact that Jesus washed the disciples' feet and that was such a tender thing. I also can read in 2 John verses 6-9 through 9, that God will not fellowship wrongdoing. Acts chapter 5 just taught us that. I can read in my Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 7-11 through 11, that those who fellowship sin lose fellowship with God. That was the point. That's why Paul, I said that the church has to exercise a, a disfellowshipping, a withdrawing, a, an identification that people aren't doing the right thing. That's what happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If we had the time, we'd read the whole thing. But that's what's happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If you, if you continue to act like nothing's wrong, when people just walk away from the faith, you're wrong too. So what has to be done? Something has to be done. And that's the removal of that fellowship. And then lastly, just think about this. The fact that this has to be done. Because normally, most everyone would think that is a massive step backwards. This is what kept the church growing. Look in verse 11 again. Just look in Acts chapter 5. Look in verse 11 again. Acts chapter 5. We're going to read verse 11 again. Then I'm going to go on and I'm going to show you one more passage. Verse 11, great fear came upon all of the church and upon all of those who heard these things. You know, you would think that if you've got to do this, you've got to do something negative, then nothing ever good is going to happen again. But look in verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. And do you know what? I'll give you my opinion. If you don't agree with it, that's okay. People are only convinced People are only convinced about something when they find out that it means something to you. Okay? There's, there's two things that go on. First of all, you've got to identify that there's value to it. But secondly, you've got to realize that it means something to someone else. The person who's trying to convince you to, to buy this. One of the reasons why you're persuaded is because you understand, you intuitively feel that means that brand means something to them. So as we go out and we do what we can, we try to live righteously the way that we should. We're caring about a message, the Gospel, which consistently showed it meant a lot to God. It meant a lot to God positively to make sure that the right message and the proper message and the full message is transmitted. But it also means a lot to God in the fact that its pure message is transmitted. So not only do I not have the right to change it, but I don't have the right to leave people who are, who are not doing right, who are doing wrong, and who refuse to change within the confines of the assembly of God's brain because that's not what God wanted. And you can see that on the screen in front of you. It was serious to God. And as I go out and as we try to live and show that it's serious to us, that's what makes people want to change. That's what makes people see the value in it. You don't act on anything unless you see the value in it. So, how was the church able to grow? The church was able to grow. Acts chapter 3, 4, and 5 in the midst of all of this controversy. It's able to grow 
because people went out and powerfully preached it, even though they didn't seem to be competently trained for it, they had a conviction. They backed it up by the fact of their righteous lives. And then it was kind of summed up, regrettably, but you just don't have control over things a lot of times, but it was summed up by the fact that when sin did enter among those children of God, it was taken care of. And it served as an example, a, a communication for us that when sin is, is among us, we have to take care of it. We don't take care of it the way that God did with Ananias and Sapphira. That was His prerogative. But we take care of it the way that God tells churches to take care of it. It shows that it is serious to us. And that it needs to have value to people. And that's where we conclude. With the future. With the fact that guys following the New Testament can have unbelievable value in your life. Being here can have unbelievable value to your life. And not just to your life, but to the next generation, your children. Not just to that generation, but if that generation then raises their children to be godly people and conscientious people and understanding the principles we've studied about this morning, it can have benefits to that generation. And then it can keep on going. I've met a lot of three, four, five generation Christians. I wish I'd met more, admittedly. But I met a bunch of them. Because somebody back down the line saw the value in it. And they acted on it. All we're asking to do today, that's our invitation. If you want to talk about it, come up here and talk with us. After we close, if you want to talk about it, then grab me and let's talk about it. It has value for you. These people in the New Testament, in the early portions of the church, showed that. We need to proclaim it. We need to live it. We need to stand for it. And we need to make sure that we can bring others into that fold because you see the value in it. Don't do anything. I'm going to close with this. Don't do anything unless you want to do it. Don't do anything unless you're convinced that it's the right thing to do because this just going in it halfway isn't good enough. We'll talk about that tonight, interestingly enough. Do it because it means something to you. Now, if you want to do that, you're going to get the chance to do it. And we ask you to. Let's respond while we'll stand and Richard will lead us.